Hi, this is Paul. I want to make a video on what I call the idolatry of kindness. Now, ran into it a couple times on Twitter. Dave Rubin had a really lovely video about a conversation with his grandmother who, who passed away. Uh, Andrew Sullivan, I thought, had... I, I read Andrew Sullivan every Friday and, again, really enjoyed this piece that he, he put forward today. I was watching the Democrats for the last two evenings, and last night as I watched, I thought, um, this is all kindness. This is all kindness. Kindness is a wonderful thing. Kindness is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But idolatry is when you take a good thing and you make it an ultimate thing. So, so Dave Rubin posted a really lovely tweet about his grandmother and i i almost don't want to say anything and i'm certainly not saying anything about the tweet because it's a lovely little conversation he has with his grandmother but i thought she articulated exactly where what many in america have put at the top of their value hierarchy just just listen to what whoops just listen to what she has to say so you're 85 mm -hmm. and I'm 35. So yeah. we have 50 years. Yes, that's a lot. That's but a lot. I don't feel old. But you don't feel old. Yeah. Well, how do you feel? Happy to be alive. Yeah, and did you learn anything in all these years? Like, what can you say? So. What can we say? Life is a mystery. It is. It is. That's what I've learned. Yeah. You can't be sure of anything. Yeah. You, try, you, should be, you should be kind. Yeah. That's the most important thing is to be a kind person. Yeah. That is be good, and nice to people, yeah, and and hope for the best. Yeah, do the best you can. That's the most important thing to be a kind person. Be good, hope for the best, and then they're going to talk about that Dave is gay and that she doesn't have a problem with that, and it never comes up, and so on and so forth. But but it, the especially at the beginning, it's the kindness piece I want us to focus on because this I think in America has become what a lot of people think should be at the top of the value hierarchy. As I was watching, I watched, I didn't watch the whole thing either night, but I was watching both of them. I, I really saw the contrast from, say, the 2016 Republican Republican debates, because, of course, there wasn't much between uh, Hillary and, and um, Bernie Sanders in 2016 for the Dems, but the Republicans had all of these people on stage and they all wanted to be the strongest. One was going to be stronger than the other. And, and it was a race to strength. For the Dems, it's a, it's a race to kindness. And they outdo each other, trying to be more kind than the next person. Um, the Dems want to be seen as kind first. And I caught this other tweet. Um, the height of the open borders, Dems raise their hand on illegal alien health care is proportionate to each candidate's level of sincerity. I thought that was a great tweet because that's exactly what I thought when I saw them all raise their hand. And what was what struck me from this entire debate was I have to I am kinder than everyone else. And so it's kindness first and it's kindness towards immigrants and it's kindness towards women and ethnic groups and identity groups and it's kindness towards the sick and the poor and the children and 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 what's really important is that everyone gets to realize their dreams okay now now as we go through this video pay attention to consciousness and how it works realizing your dream means that you in your in your conscious in your conscious mind you form this dream and and you want the it starts in your conscious mind it starts inside yourself and it goes out to the rest of the world and the the value that these candidates are offering is that they will be able to maximize individual dreams going out to the rest of the world. Now pay attention to the hierarchy. The individual dream is what's important. In exclusion from, and consciousness is very much like that, in, in exclusion from almost everything else. Now strength does come up in the debates. Um, they're not going to let states limit abortion. You know, this is what we're going to federalize health care so that anyone, well, I guess anyone that can get pregnant, 
Um, I, I suppose it's no longer women's rights. It's it's womb rights. Anyone that can get pregnant can get an abortion, and the and the government will pay for it. And the same with and so then it was on to on to transgender surgery. And again, the the whole thing was a race. It was all I'm more kind than you, and kindness means saying yes to what anyone. Now we're going to have to qualify that because you think about this for two seconds and you realize that yes to some means no to others saying yes to anyone's dream and now we're going to stay very unspecific about the dream for now and then strength comes second uh against state limits on abortion against our political rivals now now this was almost flipped over completely four years ago with the republicans because then it was strength first and it was against evil and for right and it was military and law and and a strong economy and and strength against our political rivals and and we are going to win in the world against our competitors against china and against iran and against you know, anyone who chairs, dares to challenge us at strength and, and via strength, we will, we will get better trade deals and using strength. I mean, everything was about strength with the Republicans and kindness was second. And every now and then you'd hear the underside. Well, you know, compassion to the elderly and compassion to the unborn. And again, it's, it, it was, I mean, watching, comparing these years is like, well, these are, strength and kindness which one is most important and and so if you're feeling let's say insecure well what do you want you want kindness or do you want strength which one will satisfy you now without a functioning hierarchy what you get with this kind of thing is confusion because it's a race and and what that means is it's a marketplace so so we want the the most bang for the buck be kinder than anyone on stage court towards your kindness targets now pay attention there are kindness targets and be stronger than anyone on stage towards your strength targets all right so the the evil states that are limiting abortion 30 states and i thought oh you're gonna run for president in 20 states and not 30 it gets incoherent and silly pretty quickly because balance is the enemy in a race. You don't want to be the average runner. You don't want to take all ideas into, into consideration because you'll lose the race. And so what you do is you appeal to reactivity. And, and it's always interesting because the, those who win the debate, uh, Kamala Harris, for example, last night against Joe Biden, because she was able to show herself the victim of Joe and and old Joe and young pretty Kamala, and and so and so again, it's a it's a race, and so she was the victim, he was the perpetrator, she is moral because kindness is towards the victim and against the perpetrator so on that little interchange she wins biden loses and again this is the sweepstakes this is the competition now now trying to be both at the same time doesn't really work because there's no space for integration and you can sense the tension when you listen to them talk in in that you know kindness towards certain groups but but no kindness against these other groups but they don't quite know how to make that transition between kindness you know stories about my family well well my grandma she my grandma suffered in nazi prison camps so well there you go they get the got the nazi card in there well well i was a child that i was a child in oppressive berkeley california <laughs> that you know, and I thought, well, Berkeley, that's 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 really the place of your suffering is Berkeley. But I was the child in Berkeley, California, and and we suffered. OK, this is the race. But then you get to strong. Well, well then the about the only kind of strength you can actually articulate is vengeance. All right. So so notice that in in a race where everything is kindness vengeance is the st only strength that's permitted on stage and so you have this you have this moving towards the extreme more kind more kinder than anyone and more vengeful 
than anyone. And But of course, the transition between these two things, that's not so easy to do. Now, there are, there are underlying cross pressures to all of this because, you know, kindness and weakness and victimhood, but, but that's where the kindness and the vengeance start to come together because, well, kindness and power usually come together in mercy. But, but, because mercy is the powerful showing kindness. But, but this grates against the egalitarian ethos. So mercy implies hierarchy and and signals elitism so so they have to be very careful with that so again they're they're very careful with a bunch of these narratives now now with the republicans you have almost the exact opposite you've got strength and power and justice is the is the powerful enforcing laws and and laws are about choices though and choices and kindness have trouble coming together because Choices mean upsides and downsides, and, and you can't be consistently kind, and so that's why you get kindness and vengeance coming together. And then you get justice and compassion, because compassion is sort of like mercy. It's, it's, it's something that the powerful can show, but, but, but actually justice and compassion work a little bit more easily than kindness and power or kindness and vengeance all right now one of the one of the pieces i've been really trying to work in for my last few videos have been the progressive evangelicals because i've been reading frank schaefer and and i really enjoyed his book crazy for god and and i want to get into his book um, about being an atheist and being an orthodox orthodox um orthodox christian and and so Right there, again, with Frank Schaefer, Frank Schaefer is someone, you know, Jonathan Peugeot is so good with this stuff. I, I just love the way he, he, he talks about these things. Because Frank Schaefer is this, is this outside figure, and so he's a fringe figure in, in Jonathan Peugeot's center and fringe thing. Because he's, well, he's, he's a European, he's, he's this perpetual outsider, but in the strange dynamic we have now, he comes in and he speaks... He speaks for the he speaks for the group, or he speaks for the for the left, and so so Frank Schaefer is a very interesting guy. And all now I found a videotape, only less than a thousand views, of Frank Schaefer having a conversation with Brian McLaren. Now now Brian McLaren is is about as good a Brian McLaren, Rachel Held Evans, uh, Rob Bell. I mean, these are some of the, the luminaries for what we should call the, the progressive evangelicals. And, and what's interesting about the progressive evangelicals is because, is, is that kindness is, is very much the wave that they've been swept into. And if you listen to almost any of the narratives of progressive evangelicals, it's, it's all about kindness. Um, the identity groups come up, of course, and, and it, Frank Schaefer did a reading on his on his latest book at at Books at Google, and it's it's very interesting, and I want to I want to play some of that. In the toilet, we congratulate one mom for finally getting a job with health care insurance benefits, and commiserate with another about the challenging childcare schedule of a night nurse. <clears throat> some of the mothers are stay-at-home parents, while others hurry away from the office at lunchtime to meet their child, deliver her to the babysitter and race back to work. Some have told me about problems with teenage stepchildren, previous marriages, divorces, and their struggles to fit into New England after moving from friendlier parts of the country. So no, notice friendlier parts of the country. And, and, and this again is Frank Schaefer is, I think he's just a, I think he's just a, a perfect guy to watch in all of these conversations because locating him is 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 very very tricky because he's been so many things and he's been at the extremes of so many things. He was a a a religious right darling in America and now he's a progressive evangelical darling in America but he's not actually evangelical he's orthodox he's an atheist darling but he's not actually an atheist in other words he's i i really don't have the words for it to try to locate him maybe i should ask i should ask jonathan so but but friendlier parts of the country and again 
what's at the top of the hierarchy? What, how is kindness, can, is, is the small town more kind or is the small town confining? Is the big city kind or is the big city confining? If you look at conversations in like the 50s and the 60s when suburbanization was going on, the big city was cold and the small town, think, think Mayberry and Andy Griffith. Well, well, they were kind, but now kindness has sort of, has sort of moved and the, the small town is no longer kind. And so what you're, what you're getting at, again is this this subjective internal consciousness welfare where the self and the, the self and the ego get to have what they want but now I, I probably shouldn't have stopped it because this is again I think this little clip from his book and from this video very much articulates the sort of inversion that's happening right now some moms are to fit in about problems with teenage stepchildren, previous marriages, divorces, and their struggles to fit into New England after moving from friendlier parts of the country. And, and also notice that all of those are relational strife things, uh, difficulties with teenage stepchildren. And, and this is, this is, again, as, as you listen carefully to the narratives, relationality is so fundamental but you get these passing references to difficulties in relationships that are impeding the the reaching of my dream which is in my little consciousness cloud some moms arrive in old cars while others drive new suvs no matter what we drive or earn or if we're married black brown white single gay heterosexual or divorced when we get down on our knees at eye level with our babies as they run into our arms, we understand each other perfectly. Now, get down on your knees. Well, there's, you know, there's a religious thing, but now we've twisted it. We're getting down on our knees to our babies. Perfectly. He's black cars while others drive new SUVs. Now he's got class, he's got race, he's got sexual orientation. He gets them all in here. No matter what we drive or earn, or if we're married, black, brown, white, single, gay, heterosexual, or divorced, when we get down on our knees at eye level with our babies as they run into our arms, we understand each other perfectly. Now there's a new community. And what's it a new community around? The child we're meeting touches the core of our being. The child we're meeting touches the core of our being. Okay, this is this is hierarchy language. This is at the center, the core, right? This is at the heart. This is at the top. Every mom delights in the pint-sized human shouting, "Hi, mommy!" The shouted greeting that makes my heart skip is, "Hi, ba." This is this is the ultimate. This is realization. I'm called Ba. Our shared experience of vulnerability erases the age and gender differences between the young mothers and. Are shared. I mean, this is gold. This you cannot articulate the ethos of the moment, and this is this is I think you know Frank Schaefer's great gift. He can he senses this stuff. This is what writers do, and just lays it right out there. And this is this is the Democratic primary right here. Me. We share a fearful solidarity, <clears throat> call it the flip side of love. The flip side of love. Hmm. If anything awful were to happen to the child clamoring into our arms, the universe, as we know it, would end. Think about what he just said. And again, I want to I want to back this up because this whole thing is is really important. Babies, as they run into our arms, we understand each other perfectly. The child were this is this is what this moment this moment of parent child grandparent child this moment of embrace this is what the universe is about this is exactly our moment okay this is this is what is at the top of the hierarchy this realization of the dream and <laughs> I have so many thoughts that go through my head when I make these videos this is this this has become god okay this has become god in our culture our meeting touches the core of our being every mom delights in the pint-sized human shouting hi mommy the, the the irony though that this is about a child 
is about a small child and a young child is because small children, young children are in many, many ways um, more subservient to our will. You know, you remember what got mentioned earlier in the group, the, the, the stepchild. Well, well how, how are stepchildren? Well, death or divorce. And, and divorce got mentioned in there. Divorce is, is on one moment a, a, a cause of stigmatization. Well, that person's divorced. But on, on the other moment, divorce is uh, an artifact of a failure of exactly that moment. Now, now what's so important about here is that, again, it's the parent-child moment. It's often it's imagined to be the, the consensual um, adults moment. But again, listen, listen to this whole thing. This is, this is gold, what he's got going on here. This is, this is exactly where we're at as a culture. Night nerd. <clears throat> Some of the mothers are stay-at-home parents, while others hurry away from the office at lunchtime to meet their child, deliver her to the babysitter, and race back to work. Some have told me about problems with teenage stepchildren, previous marriages, divorces, and their struggles to fit into New England after moving from friendlier parts of the country. All relational, but all relational things that have, that have clouded the, the cloud of consciousness. Some moms arrive in old cars while others drive new SUVs. No matter what we drive or earn, or if we're married, black, brown, white, single, gay, heterosexual, or divorced, when we get down on our knees at eye level with our babies as they run into our arms, we understand each other perfectly. That's what we have community around. The child we're meeting touches the core of our being. Every mom delights in the pint-sized human shouting, hi, mommy. The shouted greeting that makes my heart skip is "Hi, Ba." Now, of course, if you read, if you read "Crazy for God," the the message you get about his parents is neglect that that Francis and Edith weren't there for him. So again, we could play psychologist and say, "Well, is it any wonder it's that parent-child thing that for him is now at the center of his emotional worldview?" I'm called Ba. Our shared experience of vulnerability erases the age and gender differences between the young mothers and me. We share a fearful solidarity, <clears throat> call it the flip side of love. If anything awful were to happen to the child clamoring into our arms, the universe, as we know it, would end. The universe would end. Well, well, what is existence? What is life? And so with a passage like that, what I try to do is something that I see too little of in a lot of writing about philosophy and religion. Which... Too little of in a lot of writing about philosophy of religion, but just about all the rest of the writing. All I do is something that I see too little of in a lot of writing about philosophy and religion, which all is part of this certainty addiction that does not embrace the paradox, and that is it. The certainty addiction. Well, I, I would say it's, it's more than certainty. It's, it's, it's multiple views, okay? Puts it in these kind of didactic intellectual terms. It is not where anybody lives. It is not where anybody lives. Well, well, that's so striking because, well, where does everyone live? Well, everyone lives right there where you live. And I thought that was the great crime. And what we all care about is our version of Lucy and Jack, whether we're married or single or gay, straight, whatever it may be. We have in our lives a completely different dynamic than the official belief system that we say we subscribe to. And it has the official belief system we say we subscribe to. It has to do with the people we love and what we actually care about and what makes us tick. And so what I've tried to do in this book is be as honest as I can about that and not uh, keep trying to act as if I have some omniscient view. to not, not act like I have a monarchical vision of the whole world. Share with people that will lead them to my truth as if somehow that's an exclusive truth. And to get away from that, I do two things. I... Part of what's interesting about exclusive is that there's nothing more exclusive than Ba and his grandchildren. Other children aren't included in that. 
Every other child isn't included in that. In fact, this is the most exclusive relationship you can imagine, mother and child. Or, or you know, it, in fact, one might argue that the parent-child is, is even more exclusive than lovers in a certain way, especially in our present context. I write in this way as a novelist, as a storyteller, but I also then come back and describe what I believe or don't believe the way the earlier passage uh, landed. Now, what's so interesting here is, is there's assertion demand is that face-to-face -face personal subjective be at the top of the hierarchy of our knowledge and behavior. And this is extremely common right now. And, and this is an attempt, I think, to reintegrate the subjective, but now at the top. A new monarchical vision, or rather, really, a solipsistic vision. And, and again, you, you see this when you listen, for example, to the democratic debates. This is, this is exactly the language they are all doing there. They continue to try to frame experience within the personal relational. Notice how often they get into their personal story. And everybody needs an angle into some of the stories. And it has to be a personal angle. So Joe Biden's son died of cancer and served in Iraq. Camilla, Camilla Harris, well, she she's a person of color and she's a woman. So, well, points for that. And it's very interesting because really before she was senator, her, her only claim to fame was being attorney general, which is, so now you've got strength. And so you can see in many ways that despite the fact that politically someone would, would look for an executive office like, like a governor or something for, um, you know, as a qualification for this job. And, and often the Republicans use business, but her qualifications tend to be well, her identity aspect, she was a victim, she's a woman, she's a person of color. And, and so, and again, listen to these right away. That the most interesting, one of the most interesting people on stage was the author who, she's not even caring about the details or policy or laws or anything. She goes straight to the metaphysical <laughs> or she goes straight to the metaphorical. And, and, and again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to reintegrate the subjective into the world. So, so we are very much getting postmodern here because modernism was all about the monarchical vision and, and all about this objectivity. And so here Frank Schaefer saying, none of that stuff matters. It's all about the, the impersonal and gay or straight, wealthy or poor, single or married, or uh, none of those things matter. It's all about that moment. But then a few moments later, it won't just be all about that moment because, well, you can't manage your hierarchy. See, integration isn't easy. Just we, the Christian Reformed Church just had its synod, and I'm tempted a few years back, I did a review of synod, and last year I did a conversation about synod. That This was the safety synod for the Christian Reformed Church because, of course, child sexual sexual abuse in the, in the shadow of the Roman Catholic pedophile priest situation, all this emphasis on protecting children. And, and in fact, this year they had a, had a use of power item on the agenda. And what was interesting is that if if the problem is power, the answer seems to be more power or centralized power. And so they have a group of so-called guardians who are going to uh, die, who are going to watch our use of power. And I watch this and I think, does does no one see the ironies in these in these strategies? It's it's sort of like if you have a leak in the basement um, what, you know, water is leaking into your basement. The, the answer is a garden hose. And, and it's like the answer to, the answer to flooding is water. Uh, this doesn't make any sense, but this is the age we're living in right now. And again, one of the moments at our synod was they had everyone do something like with a rock or something. If you knew someone that was a victim of, of, of sexual abuse. Now the thing is, if 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 I heard that someone was 
if my children aren't little anymore. But but if if my, so I heard that someone was molesting my child, I mean I I I I'd burn anything down that stood in the way of me protecting my child. And and that gets into again this moment of 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 Frank Schaefer and and this and this togetherness bond. But here's the thing that we all know about this. We don't let the judge whose spouse was killed in a DUI try DUI cases for this very reason. We have jury selection about this. Uh, we, we try to get people out of it. People who have, in many ways, personal information, personal contact that might distort what? Objectivity. And, and so we have all of these tensions going on right now. That, that we don't really know how to resolve, but we're trying to run the world with them. Now, now when I was thinking about this, I thought about, now, now John and I have scheduled a conversation, and we're going to talk sometime in, in mid-July. You know, one of the, one of the comments that, that he made about Luther and narcissism, and that's something I really want to, at some point, hope to explore with him, because he's got a point, but, you know, I, I want some ways to challenge it. And because this is, I was, we sang a song last Sunday, and it's not really my favorite song. I stay out of song selection in the church because I've already got enough hands and enough things in a little church like this. But there's a song that has, says, you know, basically of Jesus, you took the fall and thought of me above all. And every time we sing that line in that song, I think of narcissism and, and, and these, this Protestant pension for narcissism that is that is very much an element in the overall narrative you know especially of of protestantism and now it's very interesting looking at these progressive evangelicals moving further down that way complaining about christianity because there's too much law there's too much objectivity it's getting in the way of this this holy huddle this this intimate embrace this this moment of face to face meeting and and if my ch if something would happen to my child my universe would be gone you have unconditional love in in protestantism especially in calvinism you know no pre qualifications no overt behavioral um qualifications but this obviously can never be maintained. And again, in, in Frank Schaeffer's thing, you have tales of it in people's backgrounds, the stepchild that, that you can't have this connection with. The divorce, the person that, that you got together with and pledged undying love and you couldn't make the relationship work. And, and this again gets into this, if the monarchical vision is timeless because it's objects in space the solipsistic vision is also timeless and again both of these are a function of consciousness which is in a sense a timeless moment and and then the question is what is filling that timeless moment now these progressive evangelicals are rebelling against the law and and this has always been a tension in in evangelicalism you had you had billy graham running his crusade and and again and again the the stadium evangelist says come just as you are you you know just come just as you are well well pretty quickly and they might not tell you that up front they're not going to want to keep you as you are and and i think that's actually important and true because Behind the whole idea of coming forward is the idea that there's something lacking in you. But we have this strange, we have this strange fantasy in our culture that says the better me in the future can be had without, to use Jordan Petersonism, burning away the dead wood. all these things that we're at right now you know jordan peterson one of the better moments of the um of the one last question with david nasser was when peterson gets to that point of of getting at the heart of this this thing that has that has 
kind of occupied not just Protestantism, but but really Christianity, this question about God's agency or ours. And I'm reading a terrific book right now, which I can hardly recommend. Uh, Ron Dart recommended it to me, uh, Erasmus, Luther, and the Fight for the Western Mind uh, by Michael Massing. So many of these issues boil down to, to Erasmus. When Erasmus, you know, takes the Vulgate, and he's a big fan of Jerome, but he starts realizing that, for example, one of the differences between the Latin and the Greek was the, in Ephesians 5, Paul talks about marriage as the Vulgate translates it a sacrament, where in Greek, the Greek was mysterion. And you begin to find all of these elements of the New Testament that, that are different in the Greek from the Latin that, that, Jerome didn't translate very well, and in fact, even 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 Erasmus cheated in a number of areas as he was working through that. And it becomes the Textus Receptus and the base for the King James Bible. So you have this tension between the church and an established group of ideas, and then this science that can now literary science that can now penetrate even deeper. And, and you get into these questions because I'm reading this at the same time I'm reading um, the the book on Barfield that, that Mark Vernon sent to me. And, and so you, you begin to realize that, boy, all of these things come together in terms of question. Well, well, what is language and how does it work and how does it, how does it, what does it evoke in us? And, and, and then we begin to wonder, well, well, what is God moving and what is me and, and then what is spirit? I think the best treatment on love and kindness comes from C.S. Lewis, The Problem of Pain. And so I want to read some of that. C.S. Lewis is wrestling in this book with the goodness of God. By the goodness of God, we mean nowadays almost exclusively his lovingness. And in this, and in this we might be right, but by love, in this context, most of us mean kindness, the desire to see others than the self happy. And again, you watch the, there'll be way more democratic debates. I got to wean that field way down. But, but when you watch these things, listen for kindness. And then when it comes time to watch the Dems and the reps square off, it's going to be kindness and strength. I did a conversation with a, with a, that I'm going to be posting coming up probably next week. I got a whole bunch of things in the can again. So when I get to vacation and when I'm not doing many conversations, I'll, I'll continue to, to dribble them out. I try and put them out one a day, not too many, because I don't want to overwhelm you. But, but, you know, when we talked about the archi the, the Jesus archetype, it's strength and kindness. And, and how Jesus puts these things together. But, but as a culture right now, we're having so much difficulty with them. Dems are kind. Republicans are strong. In this moment of consciousness, which one will you choose? By the goodness of God, we mean nowadays almost exclusively his lovingness. And in this we might be right. But by love in this context, most of us mean kindness. The desire to see others than the self happy not happy in this way or that but just happy okay now, now pay attention in this in this kind of grand benevolence that the democrats want to project in the country that's exactly what they're offering they're offering happiness can the government keep you happy What would really satisfy us would be a God who says of anything we happen to be doing, what does it matter so long as they are contented? We want, in fact, so much a father in heaven as a grandfather in heaven, a senile benevolence who, as they say, like to see young people enjoying themselves, and whose plan for the universe was simply that it might be truly said at the end of each day a good time was had by all. Not many people, I admit, would formulate a theology in precisely those terms, but that is in fact what's going on now. But a conception not very different lurks at the back of many minds. I do not claim to be an exception. A conception 
Let me read that sentence again. Not many people, I admit, would formulate a theology in precisely those terms, but a conception not very different lurks at the back of many minds. I do not claim to be an exception. I should very much like to live in a universe which governs on such lines. But since it is abundantly clear that I don't, and since I have reason to believe, nevertheless, that God is love, capital L, I conclude that my conception of love needs, correp needs correction. I might indeed have learned, even from the poets, that love is something more stern and splendid than mere kindness, that even the love between the sexes is, as in Dante, a lord of terrible aspect. There is kindness in love, but love and kindness are not coterminous. And when kindness, in the sense given above, is separated from the other elements of love, it involves a certain fundamental indifference to its object. That's important. Be because in a sense, in this idolatry of kindness, in this cult of kindness, we pretend that every single person must be important. Because again, in this, in this worldview that Frank Schaeffer has, has conjured before us, and in this moment that the Dems keep wanting to keep wanting to locate and bring in personal about the grandma that was in the the Nazi concentration camp about the the child who who has been who has lost their life in the custody of US immigration about the the father and son who father and daughter daughter better than son father and daughter who lost their lives trying to to get through the Rio Grande this is, this is the moment that fills the consciousness that excludes all time and becomes the, the summum bonum, the, the sum of all being in many ways. But it always has to be away from us. Kindness consents very readily to the removal of its object. We have all met people whose kindness to animals is constantly leading them to kill animals lest they should suffer. Kindness, merely as such, cares not whether its object becomes good or bad, provided only that it escapes suffering. And again, you, when you think about that, pay attention to that when you're listening to the, the kindness cult operating in our culture. We wish that it be contented, but don't intrude in my don't intrude in my consciousness bubble. I, I did a conversation with a, with a woman that I met at, at a couple of the Southern California meetups. Probably won't play it um, because I kept getting interrupted because my wife had to go to the doctor. So I had to, I had to leave and so on and so forth. My wife's fine. Um, but one of the things that she noted, she, she talked about her struggles with mental illness and she, she's struggled with bipolar. And she noted that Everyone likes you. They're, they're far more concerned about your manic than your depressive. And, and I've noticed that too because depressed people you can sort of ignore. And, and you feel bad in the abstract that they're depressed, but as long as they're depressed someplace else and they're not triggering my moral, the, my, my, my mirror neurons with their depression, this is very much how we are. And this is very much the way society is. I have a good friend who works in politics in Los Angeles, and when we talk, we talk about homelessness. You'll you'll find this. Um, I found a very interesting thing about homelessness in in Seattle, and homelessness is a huge issue in in Los Angeles and and in Sacramento and many of these cities now. In because again, the Democratic Party is about kindness, and so Democrats are all about kindness to the mental ill, kindness to the homeless. But once the homeless actually move into your street, all of this kindness, without actually the ability the ability to manage things, what all this kindness tends to mean is trouble. And I was talking to my friend, and we were saying how, you know, as the Dems keep playing this game, as kindness takes a greater toll on the individual, people's capacity for kindness diminishes. Because kindness really only works well when the people are not inconveniencing us. Now we're getting into the difference between kindness and love. So, so C.S. Lewis very much has this. Kindness consents very readily to the removal of its object. We have all met people whose kindness to animals is constantly leading them to kill animals lest they should suffer. Kill children 
lest they should suffer. Kill the elderly, lest they should suffer. That's kindness. Kindness, merely as such, cares not whether its object becomes good or bad, provided only that it escapes suffering. As Scripture points out, it is bastards who are spoiled. The legitimate sons, who are to carry on the family tradition, are punished. Notice how often in the breakup of a family that the that the the parent who isn't living with the child becomes the fairy god parent and the other parent feels resentment but it's kindness again it's the bastard who is spoiled it's the legitimate son who's disciplined the legitimate son who are to sons who are to carry on the family tradition are punished it is for people whom we care nothing about that we demand happiness on any terms. doesn't matter how much money it costs. doesn't matter how the other people who are living in the underclass of America feel about all of the other immigrants who are going to be living in the cheapest places of America. It is for the people whom we care nothing about that we demand happiness on any terms. With our friends, our lovers, our children, we are exacting would ra we, we are exacting and would rather see them suffer much than be happy in contemptible and estranging modes. If God is love, he is, by definition, something more than mere kindness. And it appears from all records that though he has often rebuked us and condemned us, he has never regarded us with contempt. And, and that perhaps is, is what's wrong with with Jonathan Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of the Angry God. And I, I would recommend you actually read that rather than just read the little excerpts because God doesn't treat us with contempt, Lewis says. He has paid us the intolerable con compliment of loving us in the deepest, most tragic, most inexorable sense. The relation between Creator, capital C, and Creature is, of course, unique. Now we have the parent-child, just like in Frank Schaeffer's moment, and cannot be paralleled by any relations between one creature and another. God is both further from us and nearer to us. Let that sink in. God is both fur further from us, holy, 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 God number two, and nearer to us, God number one, imminence, than any other being. He is further from us because the sheer difference between that which has its, capital I, principle of being in itself, capital I, and that to which being is communicated is one compared with, um, with which the difference between an archangel and a worm is quite insignificant. In other words, what, what Lewis is saying, and this is the point I make about the command in Exodus that God says, don't make an image of me, because what we do when we make an image of God as derived from the creation is we take an element of the creation and represent God in that way. And and what God is, is saying here, and what Lewis is saying here, is that the one that creates is categorically different than the thing that was created. He makes, we are made. He is original, we derivative. But at the same time, and for the same reason, the intimacy between God and even the meanest creature is closer than any that creatures can attain with one another. Our life is at every moment supplied by him. Our tiny miraculous power of free will only operates on bodies which his continual energy keeps in existence. God number one. Our very power to think is his power communicated to us. Our consciousness, I'm not reading, is his consciousness given to us. Such a unique relation can be apprehended only by analogies. From the various types of love known among creatures, we reach an inadequate but useful conception of God's love for man. 
the lowest type, the one which is love at all, only by an extension of the world, is that which an artist feels for an artifact. God's relation to man is pictured thus in Jeremiah's vision of the potter and the clay, or even when St. Peter speaks of the whole church as a building on which God is at work, and of the individual members as stones, living stones church. The limitation of such an, uh, the limitation of such an analogy is, of course, that in the symbol, the patient is not sentient and that certain questions of justice and mercy which arrive which arise when the stones are really living therefore remain unrepresented but it is an important analogy so far as it goes we are not metaphorically but in very truth a divine work of art something that god is making and therefore something with which he will not be satisfied until it has a certain character here again we come up against what i what i have called the intolerable compliment over a over a sketch made idly to amuse a child an artist may not take much trouble he may be content to let it go even though it is not exactly as he meant it to be but over the great picture of his life the work which he loves though in a different fashion as intensely as a man loves a woman or a mother a child he will take endless trouble and would doubtless thereby give endless trouble to the picture if it were sentient. One can imagine a sentient picture after being rubbed and scraped and recommended for the tenth time, wishing that it were only a thumbnail sketch whose making was over in a minute. In the same way, it is natural for us to wish that God had designed for us a less glorious and less arduous destiny. But then we are wishing not for more love, but for less. Now again, in kindness, what do you want? Well, we want our policies to have everyone happy, but they are away. And our exclusive vision, that which is the center of the world, as Frank Schaeffer showed us, that's the most exclusive vision of all. That's one parent, one child. And in fact, the most aspects of the child are removed. It's not loved. The child is in some ways used for that moment of that emotional flood that gives us that moment of fullness, as Charles Taylor would call it. Another type of love of a man another type of love of a man for a beast, a relation constantly used in Scripture to symbolize the relation between God and men. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. This is in some ways a better analogy than the preceding because the inferior party is sentient, and yet unmistakably inferior. But it is less good in so far as a man has not made the beast, uh, has not made the beast and does not fully understand it. Its great merit lies in the fact that the association of, say, man and dog is primarily for the man's sake. He tames the dog primarily that he may love it, and not that it may love him, and that it may serve him, not that he may serve it. And, and this is part of what's telling about Frank Schaeffer's, about Frank Schaeffer's illustration there, because children again are more susceptible in that way because we shape them and in many ways the good parent longs to shape the child because the child is now i'm saying this i mean this in a particular aspect the child is the parent's inferior okay i'm not saying anything about the the i don't want to get into the the, the whole the whole thing that John Verveke got into with respect to love, but 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 Verveke's point is right on with respect to love. That love creates, and and so the superior creates the inferior with love. I always lose my place. Yet at the same time, the dog's interests are not sacrificed to the man's. The one fashion that he may love it cannot be fully attained unless it also, in its fashion, loves him. 
nor can it serve him unless he, in different fashion, serves it. This, this sort of gets into John's Piper. I think John's Piper, John Piper's greatest book was Desiring God. That's kind of his Christian hedonism, I think, was really clever insight that I actually get from Jonathan Edwards. But, but we are most fully satisfied when God is satisfied with us. The child is most fully satisfied when the parent is satisfied with the child. The dog, and I have a dog, the dog is most fully satisfied not when the dog is somehow free. You know, if I were to, if I were to, some, my dog likes getting out. I open my door, the dog goes out. But guess what? The dog comes back. The dog is most satisfied not when the dog is free, but when the master is satisfied. And, and if you begin to focus on what this means, that, that's a very different vision of kindness where the satisfaction is theoretical and at a distance and uninvolved. I want everyone to be happy, but please don't interfere with my will in my consciousness. Because you might say in this point, in, in Lewis's point, that, well, the will of the, the God over the man, or the will of the parent over the child, or the will of the master over the dog, that will is governing. Yes, it is true. And that's why Christianity is in many ways, right from the Garden of Eden story, a clash of wills. The one end that he made it, um, that he may love it, cannot be fully attained unless it is also in its fashion loves him. Nor can it serve him unless he, in a different fashion, serves it. The parent serves the child. The master serves the dog. The god serves the man. These the, these relationships are reciprocal. Now, just because the dog is by human standards one of the best of irrational creatures and a proper object for a man to love of course with degree with with that degree and kind of love which is proper to such an object and not with not with silly anthropomorphic exaggerations man interferes with the dog and makes it more lovable than it was in mere nature in its state of nature it has a smell and habits which frustrate the man's love he washes it house trains it teaches it not to steal and is so enabled to love it completely to the puppy the whole process would seem if it were a theologian to cast grave doubts on the goodness of man but the full-grown fully trained dog larger healthier and longer lived than the wild dog and a and admitted, as it were by grace, to a whole world of affections, loyalties, interests, and comforts entirely beyond its animal destiny, would have no such doubts. It will be noted that the man, I am speaking throughout, I am speaking throughout of the good man, takes all these plans with the dog, and gives all these pains to the dog, not because it is an animal high in the scale, but because it is so nearly lovable that it's that it is worth his while to make it fully lovable now again this is where now the dog shopper might pick a breed that has qualities that the master loves but once the relationship is entered into well, my dog my dog mookie um is mostly blind I was walking the other day on the levee and I saw a man throwing having a wonderful time with a tennis ball with his gold with his with his yellow lab throwing it in the river throwing it and it was just joyful watching that lab chase that tennis ball down and bring it back to the master and I laughed inside my head because Mookie could never do that. And so some might say if I were a consumer with respect to my dog I would get a new dog. And okay, rightly so. But I love Mookie, and Mookie loves me. That, that love has been formed in time. And, and this is where this idea of consent really breaks down, because I have molded the dog, and the dog has molded me. The parent molds the child, the child molds the parent. The God molds the human, the human molds the God. Is God open to our influence? The Bible certainly says so. That's prayer. 
It will be noted that the man, I'm speaking of the thoroughly good man, I'm speaking throughout of the good man, takes all these pains with the dog and gives all these pains to the dog, not because it is an animal high in scale, because it is so nearly lovable that it is worthwhile to make it fully lovable. He does not house train the earwig or give baths to the centipede. He may wish indeed that we were of so little account to God that he left us alone to follow our natural impulses, that he would give over trying to train us into something so unlike our natural selves. But once again, we are asking not for more love, but for less. The nobler analogy, sanctioned by the constant terror of our Lord's teaching, is that because God's love for man and a father's love for a son. Whenever this is true, however, that is, whenever we pray the Lord's Prayer, it must be remembered that the Savior used it in a time and place when paternal authority stood much higher than it does in modern England, certainly much higher than it does in contemporary America. A father half apologetic for having brought his son into the world, afraid to restrain him lest he should create inhibitions, or even instruct him lest he should interfere with his independence of mind, is a most misleading symbol of the divine fatherhood. I am not here discussing whether the authority of fathers in its ancient extent was a good thing or a bad thing. I am only explaining that the conception of fatherhood would have meant to our Lord's first hearers, and indeed to their successors for many centuries. And it will become even plainer if father regarded his own, if father regards his own sonship, surrendering his, his will wholly to the paternal will, and not even allowing himself to be called good. Jordan Peterson brings that up in his um, Dare He Say He Believes in God. Because good is the name of the Father, capital G, good, capital F, Father. Love between father and son in this symbol means essentially authoritative love on one side and obedient love on the other. The father uses his authority to make the son into the sort of human being he, rightly and in his superior wisdom, wants him to be. Even in our own days, though a man might say it, he could mean nothing by saying, I love my son, but I don't care how great a blackguard he is, provi he is provided he has a good time. Finally, we come to the analogy Finally, we come to an analogy full of danger and of much more limited application, which happens nevertheless to, the, to be the most useful for our special purpose at the moment. I mean the analogy between God's love for man and a man's love for a woman. It is freely used in Scripture. Israel is a false wife, but her heavenly, her heavenly husband cannot forget the happier days. I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of my espousals, when thou went after me in the wilderness. Israel is the pauper bride, the waif whom her lover found abandoned by the wayside, book of Ezekiel, and clothed and adorned and made lovely, and yet she betrayed him. Adulteress, St. John calls us, because we turn aside to the friendship of the world, while God jealously longs for the spirit he has implanted on us. The church is the Lord's bride, whom he so loves, that in her no spot or wrinkle is endurable. For the truth which this analogy serves to emphasize is that love, in its own nature, demands the perfecting of the beloved, that the mere kindness which tolerates anything except suffering in its object is, in that respect, at the opposite pole of love. When we fall in love with a woman, we do not cease to care whether she is clean or dirty, foul or fair. We do, we do, do we rather, that's a question, I should read it that way. When we fall in love with a woman, do we cease to care whether she is clean or dirty, foul or fair? Do we not rather then first begin to care? Does any woman regard it as a sign of love in a man that he neither knows nor cares how she is looking? Love may indeed Love the beloved. Love, love may indeed love the beloved when her beauty is lost, but not because it is lost. Love may forgive all infirmities, 
and love still in spite of them. Love cannot cease to will their removal. Love is the more sensitive than hatred itself to every blemish in the beloved. His feeling is more soft and sensitive than are the tender horns of a cockled snail. In all powers he forgives most, but he condones least. He is pleased with little, but demands all. When Christianity says that God loves man, it means that God loves man, not that he has some disinterested, not that he has some disinterested, because he really is indifferent concerning our welfare, but that in awful and, surpri in awful and surprising truth we are the object of his love. You asked for a loving God, you have one, the great spirit you so lightly invoked, the Lord of terrible aspect is present, not a senile benevolence that drowsily wishes you to be happy in your own way, not the cold philanthropy of a conscientious magistrate. That's what we're looking at, right? The cold philanthropy, philanthropy of a conscientious magistrate, nor the care of a host who feels responsible for the comfort of his guests. You hear that in a lot of the talk. But the consuming fire himself, the love that made the worlds, persistent as the artist's love for his work, and despotic as a man's love for his dog, provident and venerable as a father's love for a child, jealous and inexorable, exacting as love between the sexes. How this should be, I do not know. It passes reason to explain why any creatures, not to say creatures such as we, should have a value so, pro so prodigious, so pro prodigious in their creator's eyes. It is certainly a burden of glory, not only beyond our deserts, but also, except in rare moments of grace, beyond our desiring. We are inclined, like the maidens in the old play, to, to deprecate the love of Zeus. But the fact remains unquestionable. The impassable speaks as if it suffers pa the impassable, that's I am capital I, it's, it's Aristotle's unmoved mover. The impassable speaks as if it suffers pa suffered passion, and that, it, and that which contains it itself, the cause of its own, and all other bliss, talks as though it could be in wanting and yearning. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I speak, for since I spake against, spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my bowels are troubled for him. How should I give thee up, Ephraim? He's reading from the book of Hosea. How should I abandon thee, Israel? Mine heart is turned within me. O Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth, gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Uh, get back to the right slide. What we have here is the kindness solipsistic vision. The customer is always right, but I don't have to live with the customer. I'll give the customer whatever they want, but I don't have to live with the customer. The customer is not always right if it's your son or your daughter choosing the car. The salesman picks the car for their child because the salesman knows best. But we live in a world where we say we don't want to hear no. This gives us up to the tyranny, the tyranny of the will and the tyranny of the ego. I, I laugh so often because I find people saying again and again how the ego is bad, but we're shaping our entire culture to simply feed the ego. And it makes no sense. If you want to read another C.S. Lewis book, read The Great Divorce, where it opens up in a world where you can have absolutely everything you want just by thinking of it. It's a perfectly libertarian world because you can't impinge on anyone else. Go ahead and start reading the book and read about that world and see how you like it. A couple of important pieces came out in the whole conversation about gay marriage and the, the piece in the Washington Post that a lot of people have commented on was, was striking because it very quickly noted that equality and liberation are not the same thing. And, and the piece in the Atlantic 
um, about cruising in the age of consent, both pieces really made me think of half of the image of God. What happens when you don't hear no? What happens when no is evil? Where does this really go? Rod Dreher picked up on it in a couple of different articles, and it gets into this question of consent and consciousness. Consciousness is the time-free space within which we form consent. Think about Jordan Peterson talking about tomorrow's Homer Simpson. Dreher has some particularly good uh, commenters on his blog, and this one man who is gay, married, has a child, all of it, writes this about the Washington Post article. Male sexual desire and lust is such that to say only within consenting adults is to put up no guardrail whatsoever. Consenting adults are capable of consenting in the heat of the moment or in a certain point over a lifetime of degraded and relentless mental and, and cultural grooming, to raping and being raped, to risking death to one another or one's sexual partners, to deliberately infecting others and or deliberately even fetishistically exposing oneself to infection with anyone and everything, to mutilate one's body or someone else's body to anything, to foster and normalize and to promote an adult lifetime of in of uninhibited, promiscuous, multi-partner sex is effectively to throw consent out of the window. It cannot be done. People are human beings. They are not superhumans or machines, and you will break down in spots or places over time. You will find that your will fails, and the evil part of you, we all have that within us, that is evil, all of us, somewhere, overwhelms you in some places. The amazing thing that in the kindness culture says, okay, if you need a rule, this libertarian kindness means consent. Do what you want as long as you don't hurt anyone. But we don't really give people the rights to hurt themselves. In dramatic cases, you can't sell yourself into slavery. You can't sell yourself into bondage. You can't have the doctor assist you in removing your foot because it's your body, your choice. The doctor will say, no, I won't remove your foot just because you think it's ugly. It's not fully your body. The medical establishment will not remove any part of you that is fully your, gen your genetic character. Kindness, we say, oh, okay, let them take off their arms and their legs. Let them take off their penises and their breasts. As long as they're not my child, I talk to therapists who are talking to parents who are seeing their children who want their breasts and penises removed and the parent dare not say no because this six-year-old or this 10-year-old or this 14-year-old thinks they are something or something not. Right there, consent, that little will, that consciousness, kindness says, well, if it'll make you happy, okay, as long as I don't need to live with you as long as you're depressed quietly in a room somewhere and not manic intruding into my willful little space. Kindness and love are two very different territories. Kindness is always having to say yes. Andrew Sullivan posted an article today. The first article was on, was on immigration and and Andrew Sullivan made a great point. Yeah, immigration. Everyone on the Democratic stage, we're going to be kind to immigrants. Are you also going to be kind to the neighborhoods where the immigrants flood into? Are you going to take them into your home? We want the federal government to take care of them. That's kindness. Love is living with them. And then the second part, he's, he's saying that the, the numbers, with, the numbers are, are starting to move in terms of young people and LGBT issues. So as I said, the, the Democrats are, are living in a bubble that they're, they're not paying attention to what the real world looks like when they talk about immigration or, or maybe even health care. But then the second part was, was even more striking. I wondered when this would happen, how long it would take. I asked before a younger generation revolted against the new, 
against the new orthodoxy that there is no sex binary or gender binary or indeed any place for biology in understanding the differences between men and women. How long before boys rebelled against the notion that their sex is actively toxic and in need of psychotherapy? How long before girls felt violated or just uncomfortable seeing people of the opposite biological sex in their bathrooms? It's probably as much those people seeing them. Bathrooms, locker rooms, and showers. How many are miffed that they have they have to compete with biological males in athletic in athletic contests? New data suggests that the time could be now. For the first time, we're seeing a sharp drop in tolerance of LGBTQ people among the young generation. This is entire this is an entirely new phenomenon. It used to be the young that spearheaded toleration and inclusion. Now we're suddenly bolting in the opposite direction. The number of Americans 18 to 34 who are comfortable interacting with LGBT, LGBTQ people slipped from 53% in 2017 to 45% in 2018. It's one year. The only age group to show a decline. According to the National GLAD Accelerating Acceptance Report, and that is down from 63% in 2016. Perhaps they should rename the report Decelerating Acceptance. 36% of young people said they were uncomfortable learning a family member was LGBTQ in 2018 compared to 29% in 2017 and 24% in 2016. 34% were uncomfortable learning their doctor was LGBTQ versus 27% a year earlier. 37% were uncomfortable learning their child had a school had a school lesson on LGBTQ history versus 30% in 2017. Or check this out, 62% of young people regarded themselves as allies of LGBTQ people in 2016. Only 35%, look at that drop, now say it's the same, nearly having of support. Women allies have dropped from 65% to 52%. The turn began the year that the Obama administration, with no public discussion or congressional support, imposed critical gender imposed critical gender theory on America's high on America's high schools, determining sex to be whatever a student said it would. The imposition of trans ideology by fiat on the entire country's young, along with several public along with severe public stigma for those with even the slightest questions, was almost textbook left authoritarianism, well meant perhaps, but dictatorial. And on he goes from there. Kindness is to always say yes, but not to have to live with the people. Love is a wholly different thing. Love means caring for the welfare of the other. And actually, in order to love, you have to have a vision of welfare that you, one way or another, ask, demand, insist upon the beloved. This is not something that fits in well with our culture, which is why I think we have chosen kindness and not love. That's what I've got to say. Leave a comment. Subscribe. I never tell people to subscribe, but subscribe. Leave a comment.